Hello and welcome to Autology, the weekly podcast that brings you the latest on automotive technology. On this week's episode, we'll be discussing the topic, how much driving range will the AC drain from my electric vehicle? And you're here with me, Pranav Divakar, Senior Associate at IHS Market. Today's guests are Matteo Martini, who's a Principal Research Analyst with our thermal domain, and Gia Young, our thermal expert. Hello to you both. Hi, Pranav. Thanks for hosting us. Hello, everyone. Thanks for having me. Nice to have you guys here. Now, if you were to sum up what an automobile represents to us in one single word, it would probably be convenience. You can drive hundreds of miles on a full tank, and once it's empty, you can fill up in less than five minutes, which gives you several hundred more miles of driving. But this has always been the Achilles heel of battery electric vehicles. In fact, the term range anxiety was coined for this particular reason. And... Although these vehicles are now very well suited for city drives and daily commutes, EV owners still have to plan ahead quite significantly before embarking on long journeys. And this becomes even more apparent in emerging countries where the EV charging infrastructure hasn't really become widely prevalent yet. This is the single greatest deterrent in the minds of potential EV buyers in these regions. So when it comes to extracting every last mile out of your electric car, the question that gets thrown around the most is what sort of impact does the climate control system have on how far I can drive my electric car? Jia, on that topic, why is AC uh, yeah. such an important part of the discussion around EVs? Uh, to answer this question, question it's um i think it's necessary to make a comparison between internal combustion engine vehicles or what we could call ice cars and evs so um when we're talking about ac it's not just cooling but also like heating of the cabin so we all know that um, air conditioner cooling is a major power consumer during summer for both ice cars and evs but um, the heating function we use in winter takes um, almost no extra power for ICE vehicles because the waste heat from engine is enough to warm up the cabin of the vehicle. But uh, it's a completely different story for EV since there's some um, little residue heat left to be utilized for heating purpose. So there is no engine to be function as a heat source. So in this case, we need another heat source for heating of the EVs. And in the winter, the range on EV already suffers a lot due to the cold temperature because it's not optimized for operation of a battery. And the need for heating in the passenger cabin kind of uh, makes things even worse. That's why even when we turn down AC cooling in the summer, your EV range would not be as bad as when you turn down heating in the winter. So I guess the question always came up like, is there a way to use as little electric power as possible to achieve the same comfort level as we expect in a ICE cars for EVs? So it's especially during the winter when the problem or range is more critical. Right. Interesting. Matthew, could you explain the technologies that are used in heating a car today? And uh, is there any difference in terms of energy consumed during heating when, com- when you compare it with cooling? And as 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 G perfectly laid out, so with uh, with electric vehicles, there is basically no abundant waste heat. Therefore, some other sources for eating is definitely is definitely required. Yeah, uh, there are basically four different strategies in order to do that. Um, the first one being the air electrical heater, for example. Um, this is basically just a, an electrical heater eating up the air blown into the cabin by crossing this this resistance. Yeah. Uh, if you make a comparison, for example, with the, let's say res- residential residential building, it is the, the same way as uh, forced air is heated by a furnace before being blown into, into the house, for example, like it happens usually in the US. A second strategy to warm up the cabin is a uh, coolant heater. So again, an electrical heater, still a resistive, a resistive one, uh, which warms up water, which is then circulated into an heater core uh, and it eats up the air, again, blown into the cabin. But again, uh, again, on the analogy with residential building, it's the same way as European houses, for example, warm water that is then circulated within radiator to warm up the air in, in the houses. Uh, third way is uh, heat recovery. Again, we said in the beginning that waste heat is not abundant, but still it is possible. So it is usually possible to use heat recovery as an eating strategy. It cannot be a standalone one 
usually it it's it is in parallel with with other sorts of uh, of of eating strategy but it 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 can it can still it can still still work to save some energy similarly again to the houses it's like recycling recycling waste it from from a power plant for example and the fourth approach to eating is is it pump this is basically like an air conditioning in the very same way as as an air conditioning operates uh, it it pulls it from one source and moves into the other in but in this case it basically operates in reverse pulling it from the ambient air and and releasing it into the cabin this fourth strategy is the most efficient one and it is basically using the same energy as cooling so in your initial uh, answering your initial question this only strategy is the one that is comparable to to cooling and the one that saves the most energy right i like the example that you used as well uh, how about sharing some light on the heating strategies with examples again if you could um, used by some oems worldwide and particularly about how they have evolved so far Yeah the, we we have we have already seen many examples of of uh, how OEMs are approaching different uh, different strategies in order to predominantly warm up the cabin so co- cooling down it 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 hasn't changed so much compared to internal combustion engine vehicles still uh, through an air conditioning system uh, talking about heating a few examples so the first probably most notable example of an electric vehicle is the Nissan Leaf that one that one started initially with with a coolant heater it it lived shortly and it was uh, replaced fairly quickly by an electrical air heater which is uh, quicker than a coolant one and an heat pump again to save in order to save uh, more energy uh, another good example is uh, BMW i3 another one of the initial electric vehicles that hit the market again this started with the coolant heater plus a potential heat pump as an option only in the beginning uh, then in in a few years well they remained with the heat pump only so now they offer i3 with the heat pump option only most likely because this is the preferred option by by clients in order to have a longer driving range right. a third example similar to the Nissan Leaf uh, let's say let's call it the sister of Nissan Leaf is Renault Zoe uh, this one has started since the beginning with with direct heat pump so co- basically having a solution very similar to to the Nissan Leaf on a similar trend uh, we see we see OEMs North American OEMs on on on, on a different trend GM and um, is, is it's Chevy Bolt uses a coolant heater for warming up the cabin same for ford which has recently launched mustang maki with the coolant heater as well so they seem on on a different on a different trajectory uh, if we look at asia hyundai for example is going now full on with heat pump systems they will launch the egmp platform with the heat pump systems others major oems like volkswagen for example they they have made some experiments throughout uh, the recent years uh, with uh, either coolant heater air heater uh, heat pump systems and now they have launched their big MEB platform with uh, air heater as main option and and they are offering an heat pump system as an optional uh, carbon dioxide heat pump systems as a, as an optional which can be purchased by 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 customers the last one that i would like to talk about is tesla so tesla has been through a journey of technological evolution since they launched their first vehicle so they have started with a very simple electrical high voltage electrical heater and then they evolved into they evo- they have evolved their system into an heat pump a fairly complex heat pump system very compact one it is famous because it it uses the the, the octavalve and quite interesting they are using the heat pump system not only to heat the cabin but also to to warm up the battery we expect that by 2026 at least two in three electric vehicles will use will use heat pump systems Okay. Jay, would you like to weigh in here? Ah, uh, yes, of course. Mattel talk about uh quite a few examples already. I'll just um focus on the Chinese OEM strategies in this regard. So, as of Chinese OEMs, we're also seeing a trend moving towards heat pump. And for example, BYD started working on heat pump quite a few years ago. They've been um invested in the area of both hybrid and uh EVs for quite some time. 
their top EV seller right now, the Han EV, still uses PTC heater. But um, for their newly launched EV based on their brand new platform called um, ePlatform 3.0, and this car is called Dolphin, they made the switch to heat pump. And uh, they will likely keep it the same way for the coming vehicles built on this same platform. And for some up and coming Chinese BV OEMs, such as NIO, um, NIO is an early adopter of heat pump. They have used heat pump since their first vehicle, ES8 facelift. But when they first launched ES8, in, that was in 2017, the car had two PTC cabin heaters because they want to achieve the best comfort for the passenger. Um, but the thing with two PTC cabin heater is that it's a quite big energy consumer and they quickly discovered that this setup hurt the winter range a lot and they got a complaint from customers. So then they opted for heat pump when the ES8 facelift came out. And uh, another relatively new player in the Chinese market, Xiaopeng, uh, which is kind of like Neil, but um, they still have PTSA coolant heater on their bestseller P7. But um, for their newly launched P5, they just recently launched this vehicle, they turned to heat pump as well. And other traditional Chinese OEMs like Bike, Saik, and Chang'an also adopted a heat pump for some of their models, including the Arc Fox from Bike and the Rollway EF5, Rollway Marvel X from Psych, also the Chang'an CS75, which is a uh, PHEV, a hybrid vehicle. So um, I would say in general, most the major players are shifting towards heat pump for their new models. Okay, that's interesting. I mean, we've heard that heat pumps are considered hot property right now and that the demand is, it's rising quite significantly all across the world, but they do have their limitations as well, right? Such as slow response and uh, low temperature operations, especially. Tell us how OEMs and suppliers are overcoming these challenges. Yeah, you, you're definitely right. So it is true, heat pump still have some, some, some limitations. Starting from the last one that I touched before, uh, an interesting case is the, the one the one with Tesla. So they are basically the the only one that has basically chose to completely get rid of uh, high voltage heater, and they rely on on their heat pump only on their new vehicles. Uh, it is uh, just subsidized by two very small low voltage heater, but it it looks like they are really relying on on the heat pump only which is which is quite quite odd uh, the majority of oems most of the oems are still maintaining at least an high voltage heater either air cool or coolant heater to subsidize the heat pump especially in cold condition or during quick cabin warm up uh, so this is the the usual trend in dealing with heat pump performance limitation. Uh, again, if I can if I can make a couple of examples, Volkswagen, uh, as I mentioned before, have recently launched MEB platform with uh, an optional heat pump systems, uh, very high perform, well, according to their, to their statement, a very high performing one using carbon dioxide, uh, because they think this is uh, more suitable with uh, very cold condition, but despite that, they they are still maintaining an high voltage heater to subsidize it. So it, it despite being this heat pump system more efficient than other, um, more capable of dealing with the cold temperature, uh, it's not the only source of heating. This clearly highlights that heat pumps still have some limitation. Um, another approach, another different approach in order to deal with uh, with heat pump limitation is the one used by by Toyota Prius Prime, uh, the plug-in hybrid version. This is quite a, quite, a, quite an interesting case because it's uh, one of a very few plug-in hybrid vehicles equipped with heat pump, which is usually limited to to electric vehicles only. In their specific case, they use um, an AC compressor with uh, what they call vapor injection to improve performance. And they claim 
they have been able to uh, increase performance by 10% by using this, this different technology and cope with, uh, with low, low temperature. And in that case, they went on also removing the high voltage either uh, and replaced with the low voltage one with much less power, but still it is we we still we still need to see if this is uh, suitable for electric vehicle only because in the case of toyota toyota prius they can subsidize the heating function with with internal combustion engine which is still still present right g any thoughts about this ah uh, yes so i'll just talk a little bit about like how the chinese oem trying to tackle those limitations from heat pump because um uh i could say they are decided to moving towards heat pump but um there are like things they need to overcome to to make this work better in the car so there are a couple of technologies that chinese oems are trying to work on one of them being the low temperature heat pump um, this is quite relevant for the Chinese market because in now northern China that um, the temperature could get really low uh, in the winter. So this is a focus for a lot of them for the more widely adoption of BVs in China. So um, BYD has been working on this for quite a while. And uh, as their goal was to have a heat pump system that could operate at as low as um, minus 30 Celsius. And a handful of other suppliers are onto this and they're collaborating with different OEMs to make this happen. As of um, choice of refrigerant, this is a, another way that um, a lot of OEMs are trying to improve the, the heating system. So um, in general, um, Chinese OEMs are not asking as their European counterparts on this regard because there's no mandatory request from regulation in China. So that's definitely one of the reasons, but um, there are still a couple of uh, development ongoing in this area. BYD experimented with um, R410A. This is a, a refrigerant that's um, not widely used in the industry now, but they're trying this new one because of its better performance at the low ambient temperature. And as of carbon dioxide, or what we call R744 refrigerant, it's a focus for quite a few OEMs and suppliers as well. Bike started their project with the CO2 heat pump, and um, they announced that they will probably adopt this for their new Arc Fox models, but it's not launched yet. And Sunhua, it's, um, it's a thermal management supplier in China that's um, becoming quite prevalent in the in the recent years, and they also invested in CO2 heat pump development. And other suppliers also worked on like how to improve the ACLIs because of the, the higher pressure that comes with uh, the CO2 refrigerant. I think what's striking is that both of you brought up refrigerant, and we of course have to talk about eco-friendliness on this subject. So let, I'll segue into that. With the heightened awareness of the environmental impact of various aspects of automobiles, what, are, what do you think are AC, manuf- AC system manufacturers doing in terms of refrigerants on that front? Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question because, uh, yes, EV has been brought up by environmental concern predominantly and uh, refrigerant also chimes in into environment impact. Uh, if I can briefly highlight a bit of history uh, on, on refrigerant, uh, I'll start by saying Refrigerant in the automotive industry has been used so far for for cooling purposes. As we said initially, it was always present. So so there there was no need to use refrigerant for heating purpose. It was used for for cooling strategy only. And then uh, over the years, uh, environmental regulation have significantly changed uh, refrigerant types. So everything started in the early 1990s, uh, at the time, R12 uh, was found to be ozone depleting. Therefore, it was replaced by a new type one, which was called at the time R134A. Then uh, starting in 2017, R134A has been ruled out in some countries and uh, more countries are joining this, uh, this environmental direction. Uh, because it has a very high global warming potential. Therefore, it has been replaced by an organic hydrofluor, 1234YF. 
and now uh, majority of OEMs are are adopting this this as as refrigerant. All these are let's say okay for for cooling. Some are not very much okay for eating. Therefore, some OEMs are moving into into different different type of refrigerant. As as we have already mentioned, carbon dioxide used by by Volkswagen, which is okay in term, which is good in terms of performance, which is e- e- even better than than other refrigerant in terms of environment because its global warming potential is probably the lowest possible. It is bad in terms of cost. So high pressure that G mentioned is 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 a clearly is a clear limitation when it comes to cost. Fairly oddly, in talking about carbon dioxide refrigerant, Daimler, which was the very first one adopting these systems for to pro- to provide with the best performance air conditioning on their S class in 2017, is not using these same refrigerant for for their heat pump systems. Another example is well, some are testing different different refrigerants uh, in order to have improved eating performance. One under testing is is propane, so long rumored. It is good for performance. It is good for the environment. Its main drawback is is flammability. So it is very difficult to handle that into a car. But many are testing this this option as, and it is it is very promising in terms of delivering good performance and being environmental friendly. Right, and I suppose that one could say that eco friendliness of automobiles and you know uh, the refrigerants and the thermal system overall is more important in rapidly maturing markets. So Jay, could you give us some idea about what's what the progress is in, in China, for example? Ah yes. So I want to talk a little bit about our 1234YF. It's definitely an option, an alternative for our 134A, as Mattel mentioned before. But um, there are some concerns about if it's environmentally friendly enough, because um, there will be byproduct generated during the production of this refrigerant, and um, it might be harmful to the ozone. So, and also there are a couple of underlying safety issues that comes with it. So sometimes in China, um, the trend we're seeing is that um, CO2 is generally consider it more as an alternative for the future, but um, definitely our one, two, three, four, five is still in the picture because CO2 is very stable and uh, very environmentally friendly as Mattel mentioned before. And um, CO2 is also something that could allow the design of the, the compressor and the system to be smaller and more compact, which is something that OEMs and customers would definitely like. And um, so quite a few Chinese OEMs and suppliers are more inclined to adopt the carbon dioxide heat pump in the future. Okay, so hopefully it looks like we're in safer hands now, relatively speaking. (laughs) Now, I'd like to come to one particular point. Looking at cars today that are on sale today, it's very evident that climate control systems are becoming more and more complex. Could we talk a little bit about how OEMs and suppliers are splitting responsibilities in designing and engineering these systems? Yeah, so big OEMs are doing their air conditioning system design and development in-house as they did before with the internal combustion vehicles. And uh, big suppliers such as um, Denso, Valio, Hannon, and Mala have dominated the market in this area with their um, very strong knowledge build up over the years. And um, they're also trying to position themselves or as a uh, system supplier to smaller OEMs, which may not have um, that much expertise in climate control system in general. But um, they are um, relatively expensive for the smaller OEMs, especially some startups in China. They might like really consider the cost as one of the factors. And um, so, so there are like a couple of smaller and new suppliers in the market. In China, suppliers like Sanhua, Autocar, Inlun, and uh, also Songzhi, they are quickly catching up. Then they could um, somehow provide a more affordable and reliable system and components. They, uh, I think all of them are started with uh, just supplying the components, but um, they're trying to, to, to do more development on their system and products so they could post themselves as a system supplier 
for the uh, climate control system and uh, just supply the system to the OEMs. Well, uh, I would like to add that well, we, we are through a technological revolution with, with electric vehicles. We are definitely through a technological revolution. And this is, uh, this is definitely favoring suppliers with, with, with broader, broader expertise. Uh, we see more and more electric and electronic content uh, uh, being part of, of thermal area. And uh, this, this will favor those capable of even in developing softwares, for example. We see in general more more system more system integration. Traditional components will will stay with, of course, like for example, radiators. Uh, exceptions will be, of course, component related to the internal combustion engines. Other challenges that we see is uh, we expect, for example, control panel to 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 disappear. Um, but again, this will be probably very much replaced by by the AC value overall increasing because there will be much more uh, automation into that. Okay. So in general, I would say that we expect that smaller suppliers will will consolidate with uh, with each other, and as as we see this this as as an automotive industry trend in in general, not necessarily related to thermal. Uh, right. But on the other end, uh, thermal value within cars, we expect we expect that thermal value within cars will will definitely increase. Just just to make an example, if you compare. Uh, an electrically driven compressor with uh, a belt driven AC compressor, the electric driven compressor is probably three times the cost. So value is expected definitely to increase. Jia, straightforward question for you here. What is the impact of these technologies on the overall vehicle cost? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Generally speaking, um, heat pump is more expensive comparing to the, the currently more widely use PTC heater system by um, roughly 30 to 50% depends on the supplier and design and et cetera. Um, and Volkswagen values its some um, CO2-based heat pump at roughly 1,500 euro, but um, it could um, differ because what I said um, on different suppliers and design, et cetera. But um, it's still, it's expensive, but it still makes sense to opt for heat pump because the amount of extra kilometers you can get during winter, that's definitely one of the reasons that why a lot of people are, are moving towards heat pump. And um, also because range anxiety, like we said before, has always been a major obstacle when people are talking about if they want to like make a switch to EV, they're hesitant to do this because they, they're they kind of afraid of that um, your their cars may not drive as far as they used to. And uh, heat pump could potentially provide the same amount of heating with a lot less electrical power from the battery. So the drivers and um, passengers could still enjoy the warmth from the climate control system without worrying too much about if they could make it to their destination or not before their battery drained up. So um, that's what I think I would call it some money well spent. I couldn't agree with you more. So in conclusion, since this is basically the title of a podcast itself, just how much power is drawn when heating or cooling a modern electric vehicle? Give us your insights on that. So a simple answer to that question is between 30 and 50%. Of course, is 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 not that simple. It 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 really depends on on many different uh, conditions. Uh, quite quite interesting example is a 2019 test which was conducted by the American Automobile Association. They tested five different electric vehicles, uh, BMW i3s with the heat pump system, Chevy Bolt, um, a Nissan Leaf, again with heat pump systems, Tesla Model S, and the Volkswagen e-Golf. They ran these tests into into a wind tunnel to be to be reproducible, and through these tests, they wanted to assess uh, real driving range in different uh, different climate conditions. So they basically ran a test at baseline, let's say baseline temperature, 23 Celsius degrees with the air conditioning off, and then one cold condition at minus seven Celsius degrees with the 
either AC off and AC on, and in case of AC on to target 22 Celsius degrees, and the one odd conditions at 35 Celsius degrees, again with AC off and AC on with the same target. So in conclusion, Comparing the air conditioning, the test run with the air conditioning off, they found out that range dropped between 2 and 5% in case of hot conditions and between 10 and 20% in case of, of cold condition. But then if we compare test run with a air conditioning off and air conditioning on, they found out that approximately an additional 15% range dropped during hot conditions. So when cooling was operating, cooling system was operating, and it reached up to an additional 30% range drop when cabin, when cabin was, was eaten. This basically makes for the total of uh, 30 to 50% range lost, uh, both for cabin eating and uh, other services, thermal conditioning in, the, in cold temperature, like for example, for battery, battery eating. So this is my initial 30 to 50%. One last comment about that, quite oddly, heat pump systems that we, we, we are saying are performing better than coolant heater or air heater, in this specific test performed similarly, if not even worse than the rest of, of the vehicles, mostly because we think predominantly because in this very low temperature condition, the electrical heater, which is used in this vehicle to subsidize the heat pump system, was always operating, basically nullifying the advantage of having an heat pump system. All right. So looks like you'll be soon be able to turn on the heater or the AC without any worries about how much of your driving range is going to go down, which is good news for anybody who wants to buy an electric vehicle. Perfect. And that's all we have for today, everybody. A big thank you to Gia and Matteo for joining us and to all our listeners for tuning in. We'd love to hear your thoughts on today's episode. Send across an email to orthology at ihsmarket.com and you can find much more at autotechinsight.ihsmarket.com. Don't forget to hit the subscribe, follow, and like buttons to stay on track with the latest autology podcasts. And we really look forward to you joining us again for the next episode. Goodbye.